Hey there, Wave Festival folks. I hope you guys are having so much fun at tonight's launch party. I wish I could be there. My name is Annie Sand, and I'm going to read the first couple sections from my essay in this beautiful issue. The essay is titled Flight Machines. In the summer of 81, mom packed all her earthly possessions into the back of an olive green 1975 Ford Pinto. Puke green, she called it. Her father's choice. Purchased the previous summer when he got sick of driving her three hours north to college each term. Despite little interior space, the car was built like a tank, with wide bumpers and a long, narrow grille like a chevron mustache. A future owner would roll it on a rainy night and discover it still ran fine. The car was solid, as her father put it, heavy enough to hold up in crashes, janky enough to be cheap. But for his most mechanically gifted child, he didn't see that as a problem. She loaded her gray suitcase full of clothes into the trunk, alongside a cardboard box full of books, a few CDs, and a couple keepsakes. In the back was the blonde Takamini acoustic guitar she bought herself as a graduation gift, and laid in the passenger seat a map west to Manhattan, Kansas, her first life untethered from the family farmhouse. She hadn't spent much time dreaming about her future, in a house with a temper-prone, hard-drinking father, and a mother who spent most days sleeping in a green armchair pulled up to the window, the future was a basket too flimsy to hold many eggs. But then she interviewed for a job at Kansas State University and fell in love. The limestone buildings of the campus shone in the sun the same way the limestone steeples of her home did. A river braided itself through the center of town. And unlike the close forested hills of the place she was leaving, in Kansas, you could look out your window and watch the lightning blast down from the sky one, two, five miles away. The horizon line was gray with distance. She said goodbye to her parents and two younger siblings, filled up the gas from the tank behind her father's shop, and pulled out onto the road. A few quick turns carried her through town and out onto the open highway. The spring I turned 21, I left someone I hadn't been able to leave for eight years. I'd left and come back, left and come back, like a tide that didn't yet understand its lot in life. And then, one crystal cold night in March, I said goodbye and watched him drift away over the horizon of my life, like a lighthouse that had suddenly transformed into a listing ocean liner, its stern lights blinking Morse code messages from across the water as it was pulled by invisible currents further and further away. It took a long time, a year really, for these driftings to carry him completely out of sight, but eventually they did. For a moment, I paused, staring up into the blue-black of the winter sky that seemed so much like an ocean, and then with a deep exhaling, I turned inland. The job Mom had taken at Kansas State was a hall director position, basically $900 a month to live in the dorm and make sure everything ran smoothly. Ford Hall was hers. Ten stories of co-eds who generally didn't give her too much trouble. Her apartment was big enough that the nine-foot sofa clearly repurposed from the lobby didn't feel outrageous. She eventually brought two salvaged railroad boxes to be her coffee table and nightstand. Her guitar went in a nook in the wall probably meant for a breakfast table. Every morning, she'd walk ten feet to her office, work for a few hours, then have lunch at the dining hall still in the days when some universities had their own food service, which meant local produce and fresh-baked bread every morning. Then she would read in her apartment for a few hours before dinner and a bit more work. Sometimes there was an emergency in the middle of the night, but generally things were quiet. It was a great gig, she tells me over the phone as I drive to the grocery store. I put $600 away a month because, with room and board paid for, I can feel her shrug on the other end of the line. Then there's a pause. I don't know why I ever left that job, really, she sighs. I guess I just thought it was time to move on. A few months after I left the person I couldn't leave, I made my own flight from Ohio to Iowa in a red Toyota Corolla, racing toward the line between big green fields and bigger sky. This part of the country was plained flat by glaciers, great lumbering ice giants deeper than the Grand Canyon flowing down from Canada. They ground down mountains, erased topographies, and caught boulders the weight of killer whales between their toes. Whatever interstate you take through this soft belly of the country, the horizon they rot will define your view. It's easy to get bored of it. 
I had many times before and have many times since. But that day, all those flat roads terminating in sky felt like runways that could launch me everywhere. What you thinking about? Mom asked from the driver's seat, her left hand on the wheel while her right balanced battled, bottled coffee on her knee. We were used to companionable silence during long road trips, and this question was how one of us signaled that we were ready again for conversation. Nothing at all, I said honestly. My whole life was packed into the parts of the car not filled by our bodies. Three boxes of books, three more of clothes, a small bookshelf, a lamp, a desk chair, though no desk, and two backpacks. I knew she wanted to talk, but I was too busy reveling in a strange breakneck feeling somewhere between flying and falling. A knowing settled into my gut as I looked out over the glacier-made plain. If I could leave him, I could leave anything. Thanks, guys. Hey, everybody. I'm Maya Canwall, and I'm going to read from my story, Talking with Boys. We suspected nothing when my sister Sana was born. The baby seemed to hear us fine. At the hospital, when Baba lifted her from Mama's chest and recited her first call to prayer by her ear, she woke up and kicked open her swaddle of pink and blue blankets. The Texas children's nurses marveled at her. At home, Mama sang her ditties in Urdu. I chanted Itsy Bitsy Spider. Sana flapped her arms. She cooed. Mama had the baby's seven-day-old head shaved of the unclean birth hair. Baba weighed the hair, calculated its worth in weight and silver, and distributed charity in that amount. Her hair grew back in straight and jet black and oh so thick that Mama wouldn't stop talking about it. I was only four. I hadn't thought to consider the worth of my own head of hair until then. One weekend, as Mama massaged coconut oil into my wispy strands, I mustered the courage to ask, was my baby hair as heavy as Sana's? I ached for Mama to say that mine was just as precious as the baby's. She combed my hair harder, as if to tug length from my scalp. We were too poor for ceremonies when you were born. She cut a clean part, twisting my hair into two taut braids. We're more blessed now. Baba wanted to thank Allah for that. Fortune was always on our parents' mind. Baba prayed for it. Mama protected it. She made sure Sana bore, baby Sana bore a black dot of kajal on her temple. To ward off the evil eye, she explained to me. Several inquisitive aunties in our apartment complex had the evil eye. In the days before the baby's birth, a cracked clay cooking pot of Mama's a flat tire on Baba's new halal meat delivery van, and even an unsatisfactory on my pre-K report card had been blamed on the auntie's jealousy-laden glances. I wondered if I could summon my own evil eye to curse the baby. She had better hair than me. I might thwart some other trait. I stared in the bathroom mirror, the only one in the house willing my evil eye to emerge. Was it possible that I was too young? I exercised my eyeball to strengthen it. Sometimes I stared so long that I lost perspective and my face took on dimensions that scared me, so I feared I might have inflicted my nascent evil on myself. I eyed Sana especially hard in the quarter of an hour between her bath and when Mama lay her down on my bed, massaged and diapered her and reapplied her daily dot. My bed stank of mustard oil for hours afterwards. For this transgression alone, the baby deserved the eye. A year of effort came to naught. Sana astounded everyone by walking at 11 months instead of the 14 it had taken me. When she took her first step, Baba happened to be home just having finished his ablutions for the Friday prayer at the mosque. His hair damp, his sleeves still rolled above the elbow, he picked her up from where she had plopped by the coffee table and twirled her in the air. Sana shrieked with delight. He'd never spun me that way. I held up my arms. Me too, Baba. He dropped Sana on the sofa, unrolled his sleeves and buttoned them. Can't you see? You're too big. 
I couldn't tell whether he meant too old or too large for our crammed living room. From the firmness of Mama's hand on my shoulder, I understood not to repeat my request or ask why. I was part of the setting. Sana, the shiny new thing. Mama picked up the baby and beamed at Baba. Mashallah. Baba rested his hand on Sana's head. May she walk far in life. Baba saw a good omen in Sana's early steps. He wanted to give thanks in the proper way and have a goat slaughtered in her name via the sadaka service at the mosque. But the mosque's administrative offices were closed in observance of the Friday holy day. After Baba returned to his shop, Juan, his butcher, argued with him that the mosque charged retail for sacrifices and convinced him to use one of their own wholesale goats. So Baba dedicated to Sana the first goat that arrived in his Saturday shipment and distributed shares of it to our neighbors. He arrived home anxious with doubt about whether he'd done the right thing by listening to a Catholic man, whether the charity of a goat dedicated post-slaughter would count. Mama, who appreciated Juan's good sense with finances, reminded Baba that Catholics were the closest to Muslims, out of all Christians, and hadn't the named me Mariam. She set Baba at ease so that by dinner time he was in a celebratory mood again, he talked at the restaurant his shop would expand into. Mama described her mother's vegetable garden, one she hoped to emulate when we moved to the suburbs. By the time Sana turned three, I was certain that my ill intentions had no power. On a birthday trip to the dollar store, I had chosen a bubblegum pink photo album with two by two grids. Side by side, I slid in pictures of Sana and me as newborns. My collection grew into an age-matched pairing of photographs of the two of us. She was not only prettier than me at every stage, but glowed as if she harbored so much life that her image would leap off the paper. To shake me out of my obsessed comparisons, Mama assigned me a hundred small tasks to help out with Sana. I did, to please Mama, but so far it had taken all my self-control not to topple her over on her diapered butt. One day, as I worked on my album on the bedroom floor, tucking in a picture of cutting, of Sana cutting her third birthday cake, Mama sat next to me. She's going to need you. I tingled with the premonition that I had something Sana did not. I'll help you, Mama. Not me. You have to help her. Mama took both my hands in hers. She can't talk. She's little. You were talking by your first birthday. Hi, Witness. Thanks so much for having me here and for making it possible for all of us to celebrate this beautiful issue. It's a real honor for me to have my work included. My wife and I lived in Las Vegas for four years and, and Witness was always my favorite of the UNLV publishing projects. So we would have loved to be able to join you all in the desert this weekend, but it's great to be here virtually all the same. My piece in this issue is a translation of the Argentine writer Liliana Ponce, whose work I've been translating for about six years now. The poem is an excerpt from a long sequence entitled Poema, or Poem, and this is part two of six. So I'm going to read the original poem in Spanish and then my translation in English. Cuanto hace que partí, tomaba te y después los árboles empezaron a desaparecer al lado de mi ventanilla. Cuanto hace que partí. La noche también viajaba de un continente a otro, de un país a otro. Acude a lo dócil, inclínate, mi tiempo crea la pasión. El hechizo es un muro flotante, separará siempre el viento, el ojo mágico, separará tu voz, la constelación de los rostros. Cuanto hace que partí. De la tierra desnuda y sin memoria, de lo húmedo en lo alto del mar, de la noche túnel cavada. How long since I departed. I was drinking tea, and then the trees began to disappear outside my little window. How long since I departed. The night too was traveling, from one continent to another, from one country to another. Return to stillness. Focus yourself. It's my time that creates the passions. 
The enchantment is a floating wall. It will forever separate the wind, the magic eye, your voice, the constellation of faces. How long since I departed? From the earth stripped and amnesic, from the humid crest of the sea, from the sinking tunnel of night. Thank you. Thank you, Witness and Megan Stolestra, for selecting my essay, Useful Fictions, as the winner of the 2022 Literary Award in Nonfiction. It's an honor to be part of this issue, and I really wish I could be there for the launch. I'll be reading a little bit from the beginning. Useful Fictions. Odysseus stands in the hallway of the barracks on the 28th of September, staring at a locked door. One. This is how each session of P.E. begins, sitting in a chair with your back to the wall in the Rocky Mountain VA. You chose prolonged exposure because Jake said that cognitive behavioral therapy accesses trauma through changing thought patterns, and you are wary of your own mind. Labyrinthine and cunning, yes, but more because you've tried every conceivable way of thinking your way past this, and none of them have worked. You were arrogant enough to think this meant it couldn't. When he said that prolonged exposure accesses trauma through emotion, reliving traumatic events by using imaginals, you said, everything in me is rebelling against that, which means that's probably what we should do. This will be the bravest thing you have ever said. Odysseus is alone, eyes unseeing and seeing at once. He doesn't see the number on the heavy faux oak patinated door. He sees the ghastly pale yellow paint layered thickly on the walls, a shade somewhere between canary and fairly hydrated urine. He doesn't see the second man who should be with him. He sees the linoleum peeling under the soles of his boots like skin too long exposed to the sun, blistered and flaked. Two. Hearts. Herring didn't show up for work today. Lexi told you, her voice crackling over the line. When he didn't show up to first formation, they called. When he didn't answer, they sent two guys to his door. This is a truth. Odysseus doesn't see the end of the hallway to either side of him. He sees the overhead lights that are screamingly bright, bathing the space in an unnatural whiteness. The soles of his boots squeak as he shifts his weight. He has always hated this floor. Odysseus pounds on the door. A sharp, splintered pain lances along his knuckles, the bones of his hand. Red, you're late. Get up, brother. It's time to go. Only silence greets him. In that silence, a fear, swarming up through his vertebrae to set his brain to smoldering, a slab of meat pierced and turning slowly over a fire, sizzling. Something's wrong. Red should be awake. Odysseus should be hearing a muttered swearing from within the room, a, the crash of a bedroom door shutting, anything at all. Odysseus breaks in the door. Three. How do you break in the door? Jake asks you. He levels his shoulder against it and rams, all his weight behind it, snapping the lock and practically tearing it off its hinges. Four. What's your number? Jake asks. This question becomes harder the deeper into the imaginal you get. You remember creating the scale with Jake where zero means perfectly at peace and 100 means actively panicking. In these moments, however, it's hard to say where you are. Jake says it's like you're drowning inside the wave and he's shouting, how are you feeling from outside of it while you're just trying to hold on? This is exactly what it feels like. Drowning. You are drowning. What's your number? 20, Odysseus replies. His voice is shaking. Inside, it's exactly like every other barracks room, a mirror of the ones he remembers so well. Five, describe the room, your surroundings, what do you see? To the left, a stacked washer and dryer set behind where the door would swing to a stop if it weren't splintered and wrecked. Next to them, a vanity and a sink, a mirror reflecting back that he won't look into. Across from the sink, a bathroom. Every light is off. Everything exactly as he remembers it. Six, this is how your mind will construct the space. Every corner and edge remembered as your own, from the red tablecloth and the cedar candle to the stains in the sink, the crack on the face of the microwave, the way the refrigerator leans just a hair to the right, the acrid stench of burnt coffee and the chemical one of disinfectant. Beyond the door to the right that you never enter in these imaginals are all the things you kept in your barracks room. Clothes and books and flags hanging from the walls. It doesn't matter that you know this is untrue. That you never shared a room with him. It's what your brain will use to fill out the space. It's what it used the first time, too, when Lexi called to tell you what happened and you were transported instantly to a room you had never truly seen outside of your mind. 
The room is empty. Red is nowhere to be seen. Odysseus moves for the door to the left instinctively. The fire in his brain is growing now, roasting steadily, heat rising and rising again. He can barely think. He knows he's afraid. He tries the handle and finds it locked, pounds on it as loud as he can, yells for him to get up. Seven, say that again. He yells for him to get up. No one answers, and now he's certain that something is wrong. Red should have answered the phone, the door. Odysseus hesitates. He doesn't want to go through the door into the bedroom. He's terrified. Eight, why do you go through the door if you're terrified? Because he needs help. Odysseus breaks in this door, too. Nine, what's your number? You know that zero is August of 2018 with Tyler at Willow Lakes. Is the peace of that night by the lake despite your weariness? Is having hot food despite forgetting the lighter for the camp stove and believing in the god then that you doubt more and more now because of the book of matches you found between your boots as you prayed, please let me just find something without actually expecting to? Is the long conversation in the gloaming? Is the night of sleep where you woke only once and then only from the cold? You are far from that peace now. How far? What's your number? 45, Odysseus replies. The bedroom is spare and dark. Red hasn't been here long. He's been home from Cameroon for 13 days and the space reflects it. Nothing of note, really. The same standard issue army furniture crafted of cheap, pale particle board. The twin bed is shoved beneath the window. Red's duffel bags are at the foot. Olive drab, the bottoms painted tan with his last name, last four, and first platoon, Alpha Company, first and 30th Infantry Battalion, stenciled on in flat black spray paint. Stray socks and discarded uniforms are crumpled on the floor. In various corners, a uniform top slung on the back of a chair. The bedroom is empty. The bed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pesha Sotolongo, and I'll be reading my flash story, Play Glove. Takes a little getting used to, doesn't it? The mask muffled his voice, but she could hear the resolve. He was good natured. He wasn't complaining. Where'd you get them? Online, she said, fidgeting. She wanted to pull her legs up onto the bench, crisscross applesauce like she was a kid again, and this, the two of them in hazmat suits, the empty park, the crows tossed against a parish blue sky, was lighthearted fun. But the suits were meant to be disposable and felt as if they'd easily rip. They both noticed the flimsiness. Weren't they expensive? Arms aloft, feet lifted, he examined the papery white material covering nearly every inch of him, every inch of her, all but the goggled eyes. How much? Too much, she said with a shrug. I'll help pay. I have some money left and I can try to sell the Triumph. Motorcycles are kind of dangerous, she said gingering her head until, from the corner of her eye, she could see him nodding. It felt impossible to turn all the way. The fabric would surely give, especially where the hood met the neckline, so they kept pivoting toward each other, stiff as tree trunks, like they had whiplash, eyes furtive. This was for the best anyway. It had been a while, and they felt almost shy now. From a distance, they might have been strangers waiting for a bus. Shoulder by shoulder, they watched the crows glide. Beyond the black sails of their wings, silver clouds mounted, their crisp edges unequivocal, like they knew what they were about. The sky purpled toward evening, and a breeze upset the October maple leaves, tumbled them together with assorted trash. A dirty styrofoam cup settled at their feet. He nudged it. She nudged it too and said, it'll outlive us all. From their bench, they surveyed the park and a far scattering of houses, but the crows and a few frenetic squirrels were the only living things in sight. He stood up and began to pace. After several rounds, he stopped, searched the sky, and groaned, his fingertips briefly gripping his head. She studied her feet and tried not to cry. When he noticed her that way, he said, I'm okay, we're okay, and thought to squat at her knees but reconsidered. The fabric again, so thin. Instead, he straightened his back, stiffened his arms, and began lumbering goofily to and fro. Hey, he said, I'm the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. She watched him, his eyes winking in the low light. You look like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man, she laughed. 
You look like a snow queen, he said. You look like a spaceman, she said. So he took giant slow motion steps and his eyes grew big and serious with the effort. They laughed harder. You look like a cloud, he said, puffing in the mask. You look like the Pillsbury Doughboy, but not really. He was a slender man, the hazmat just hanging from his lean frame. You look like, he paused. I'm out, but he'd nearly said ghost. The crows hollered, a grumpy row of them crowding the power line, old man hunched and swaying in the breeze. He sat down, but sideways this time, facing her, one leg hinged hard, the hazmat straining at the knee. I wish I could take you out to dinner, he said. I know it's old fashioned, but that's what I want. You in a silk dress, pearls. Pearls? By degrees, she turned to face him, gentling her limbs like prayer beads to protect the suit. Paradise to me. Black lashes ringed her black eyes, and he could just glimpse her thick brows below the hazmat shrouding her forehead. She used to pluck them, but now they met in the middle, and he found himself drawn to this bit of hair. It made her look like a Tajik bride. He could not precisely recall her nose just then, and her mouth waded into the fog of his memory as a cherry or strawberry, which struck him as ridiculous and wrong, but her eyes and those brows, they could be enough. Where would we go? She reached her gloved hand toward him, and he clasped it in both of his, waiting for their body's warmth to bleed through. What's your pleasure? She scanned the horizon, and the setting sun conjured copper from her irises. Shawarma? Sure. Jeweled rice? Yes. Kunefe? Absolutely. And dancing, she said, eyes narrowing and the mask crawling upward with a smile he couldn't see, slow and dreamy. I'd dazzle you with a fancy gift, he said. Emeralds? That is old fashioned, she rolled her eyes, but I can top it, this with a wink. What I want most is the rubies of your lips warm against mine, sweet like caramel with an oaky wine note at the back. Oh no, he laughed, and through his booty towed a silvery gum wrapper, the red tide of leaves surging and retreating around them. That's the worst, he said, and brought her hand to his mask, kissed the antiseptic fabric with a smack so she'd know what he was doing in there. I miss you, he said. I know, she said. Me too. This is hard. It'll be okay, she nodded, trying to believe herself. I want to make love with you, he said. The crows had finally gone to bed, and the park drifted into a deeper quietude. Make love with your eyes, she squeezed his hand. How does that work? Eyes are the windows of the soul. She'd always admired the particular blue of his, not light, but dark and winsome as the Black Sea of her childhood. Perhaps in this foundering world, they would show her the way. Do you see my eyes loving you? I do, she said. Thank you. I'm Eli Stoshin, and I am reading my poem Correspondences in this issue of Witness. Um, it is a triptych, so it looks like that on the page. The middle part of the triptych is the poem, so that's what I'm going to be reading for you today. Um, and this poem, as a little bit of background info, for format, it's kind of um, weird because I have facts on like each side about different portions of the poem. And then the poem itself was a prose poem that I used the cut up method. Um, where a word randomizer mixed everything around and I pulled the lines that I liked and reconstructed them together. So without further ado, correspondences. The street lamp glows as God's green skins. The scent of hot rain rolls on asphalt. The stick of juicy fruit you gave. The oak wood swing shaking on the balcony. Cicada skins, the lingering liquid silver late night adrenaline, crystalline clouds. You track me around stuck to your gum sole. You track my dinner plate eyes as they roll below your clothes. 
1111 comes and I feel stupid, but I'll take the luck if it's being offered. You are pure voltage. You, the current that never stops flowing. I cry over and over and I cannot reconcile the lightness. Patient petals that line your eyes. Scent adrenaline, what wanting. The glass bones I have grown in your presence. I want to leave it. I cicada, me crystalline, I cannot leave it. My mercurial, pure clouds, pass me your voltage. You gave you flowing. What world which swings around us? I say I wish at 1111 and you ask what for? What fruit grown of I? I don't tell you. I beg the gods for salvation from what I can lose. Hi, this is Ananda Lima and I'm reading from my story, Rapture. You probably can't tell looking at me now, but once, back in my 20s, I slept with the devil. We met at a Halloween party in some closed down store space in Union Square in 1981. I was nursing my third snake bite in the corner. Silhouettes danced to memorabilia, backlit by a makeshift red and blue neon installation stuck to a crumbly brick wall. The devil was sitting alone on a beat up brown corduroy sofa. I was inauguration Nancy Reagan, a doffo like red dress and hat, black gloves. He wore an ill-fitted suit and a faded orange wig. I walked up to him and asked what he was, yelling over the music. He said he was the future. I told him his costume sucked. He said he was often misunderstood, scanning the room as if hoping for a specific somebody else to show up. I recognize something of what I've been carrying inside mirrored on his face. I thought my friends had stood me up. In my mind, I superimposed said friends, Michael and Angela, over the scene. Michael and Angela, as I introduced them at the company Christmas party. Michael and Angela discreetly brushing their hands as they passed each other en route to the elevator when I first realized what might be happening. Michael and Angela the day I found them in the bathroom during lunch break. Those days I saw Michael and Angela everywhere. I feared the two dancers in the corner, her arms over his shoulders, his pulling her by the waist, were Michael and Angela. Though it was useless to fear it now that everything was out in the open. If it weren't happening here, it would be happening somewhere else, in her bedroom, in his, in the entry hall of the apartment building because they couldn't wait, in a taxi, on their way here. I downed the rest of my drink. Are you waiting for someone? I asked. He inhaled, suspended suspended his search and looked at me straight for the first time. Something awakened in my body. Despite his stupid clothes, he looked like a 1940s movie star with that strong jaw, his nose just the right amount of imperfection. It had been so long since I'd felt anything like that. Even with Michael, the hurt had coiled up around that feeling and all but strangled it. Yet here it was again, the flagellant want serpentining up my bones. I wanted it to stay inside me. The devil gave me a sly smile and complimented me on my nice family values. I held my fake pearls, feigning shyness, and sat next to him, then stretched my legs over his lap. I grabbed a cigarette and dangled it from my matted red lips as I fumbled for my matches. He offered me a light. It was as if he held an invisible lighter. There was his hand and there was the flame. But it was dark and I wasn't exactly sober. I leaned in. He moved the fire an inch away from my reach and said I could just say no, 
smiling as if it was some kind of insider joke. I didn't know what he was on about, but I always liked dorks. I pulled his hand towards my cigarette and inhaled. A heat flooded up from my fingertips where they touched him. It was so unexpectedly pleasant, the sparkling sensation on my skin, the warmth rising through my veins up to my palms. I let go of his hands while I still could. I took off my red pillbox hat, my Nancy wig, fluffed up my hair. I'd recently cut it Kim Wilde style, though my hair was dark brown. I slid his wig off, revealing his immaculate black hair slicked back. I covered it with Nancy's hair while facing him, our mouths inches away as I adjusted the wig and topped it with a red hat. Remaining close, I stared into him and put his orange wig on myself. He didn't look away as other men would have. Blondie's rapture started playing. Our lips were on the verge of touching. Deep into his black eyes, the reflection of the red neon looked like fire. I might have stayed there, trapped in the darkness and the fire, but someone tapped me on the shoulder and I came back to my body. They had come after all. Angela dressed as Princess Diana, Michael as Prince Charles. Their hands glued together as usual. Angela adjusted her tiara, leaning close against Michael. Their costumes were brilliant and my heartbeat was choking me. I wanted to vomit. And you are? Angela asked the devil. The devil answered he was the devil. What happened to the future? I asked. He said the future was his costume, but who he was was the devil. This is an excerpt from The Things We Name. In sixth grade science class, sometime after the D.A.R.E. unit where we learned how to just say no, and before the unit where we dissected frogs and eagle pellets, we carried around five-pound bags of sugar for a few weeks. We were instructed to name them and bring them with us wherever we went. We made baby books for them out of construction paper, documenting our baby's first words and their footprints, which we created using the pinky side of our closed fist for the soul and our own fingerprints for toes. The sugar baby was part of the sex education arsenal, but it preceded any substantive discussion of sex, or at least sex as an act between individuals. We'd had a brief, optional lesson a couple of years earlier, a sort of introduction to puberty, in which we saw diagrams of our reproductive organs and learned how our bodies were going to change in the coming years. Now, in the midst of these changes, we studied the bi biology behind reproduction divorced from many human actions. We learned about the reproductive process in amoebas and vertebrates and humans, memorizing facts like the length of gestation for a female elephant, 22 months, for a female human, nine. Then, after looking at magnified images of swimming sperm and zygotes on the overhead projector, we were charged with bags of sugar we named Brooklyn and Sydney, immaculately conceived. But of course, unlike our sugar babies, we had real bodies made of flesh and blood. We had learned early on how to categorize these bodies into distinct parts, but we jumped from head and shoulders to knees and toes, glossing over our private parts, as if they too were made of sugar or construction paper, as if one day they would be swapped out for real and functional parts. Eventually, we would find language for these parts of ourselves, but not before language found us. I'm at the front of the bus. Are you fast? One of the boys asks me. At this point, I can run faster than all the girls and can still tie the fastest boy in gym class. That's what I'm thinking when I say, with a certain amount of pride, yes, I'm fast. They laugh. You don't want to be fast, the bus driver says. A conversation about fast girls ensues, and I understand we're not talking about sprinting. My pride melts into that specific kind of embarrassment that comes from not knowing something that everyone else knows. 
I wonder who these fast girls are. Whatever it is that makes a girl fast goes unspoken, but the tone of the bus driver implies that they're a problem. Words sometimes enter our consciousness over the course of a single bus ride, but they solidify gradually, becoming a part of us whether we like it or not. They get under our skin before we have an ability to reject them. Euphemisms and slurs proliferate like weeds in the very places official language avoids. As I got older, the words sometimes changed, but certain underlying anxieties seemed to remain. A fear of cooties morphed into a fear of STDs. Gay was used as a synonym for bad on a regular basis. And there was a seemingly endless subset of words devoted exclusively to girls' sexuality. Fast, slut, ho, skank, abrupt, monosyllabic words with all the sharp familiarity of stop signs. They were a part of my vocabulary, even if they weren't directed at me, even if I rarely used them. They were spoken in the same language in which we were expected to say yes and no. But beyond saying no to drugs, did we ever really learn how to say yes and no? In the sex ed I received in sixth grade and beyond, I remember discussing condoms but not consent, learning about pregnancy but not pleasure. The information wasn't inaccurate. In fact, It was likely more comprehensive than what most American kids received, but it felt haphazard and complete. It was as if we were trying to learn algebra while avoiding the letter X. And while I was never exposed to any overtly religious or conservative obsession with abstinence or purity at school or in my community, there was still an aura of shame and fear around sex. That seemed to be the default setting created by the absence of language language and all the distortions and myths that filled that void. The money he gives me not to tell is real money. My mom and his mom are playing bulbs in the front yard, which is next to my front yard. Soon after, out there, my eyes still adjusting to the sunlight, I tell them that he gave me his allowance. I say this lightly, cheerily, as if it's a gift. I'm told that he is saving that money to go to Florida one day. I return the money without protesting. What he does to me doesn't fit into any of the words I've learned as a six-year-old. There's no name for it. The things that are nameable, the money, the moms in the garden, the feeling that something is wrong. Hi, I'm Gloria Huang, and I wrote the story Nine Steps, um, which will appear in Witness Magazine's next issue, Miss Connections, which I'm super excited about. Um, I so wish I could be there for the launch party in Vegas, um, but instead, for now, I'm going to read two passages from my story. Um, it's a little long to read the whole thing, and a couple passages are a little difficult to read out loud. They're text message exchanges, that sort of thing. So I will be reading a little bit of step six and a little bit of step eight. Step six. It was fall and she was alone in the house once more. She stared out the window, watching vacantly as dry, desiccated leaves finally let go of their branches and drifted to the ground. One, two, one, two. She wasn't even counting them. That would take too much effort. A slight movement drew her attention away from the ballet of falling leaves. She leaned closer to the glass and squinted, trying to tune the blur of leaves and trees into focus. Another movement, a mere shift of color and shape. She found herself staring into bright yellow eyes. By the time she got outside, the eyes had disappeared. She walked into the trees, parting them carefully and stepping onto the soft underbrush. A high-pitched noise rose from her right, and an animal stepped out from the tall grass. The creature was feline, with long hair surrounding its face so that it resembled a small lion. Bobcat, she thought wondrously. The animal mewed again, then trotted away from her. When it was several feet away, it glanced back and waited. She began to follow it slowly, certain that at any moment it would dart into the bushes. The bobcat waited until she was five feet away, then it set off again. She followed it deeper into the forest until suddenly the bobcat leapt into the air and disappeared. She froze, confused and a little frightened. Glancing around wildly, she confirmed there was nothing around her but trees, grass, underbrush, dirt, and weak speckled sunlight that squeezed between branches. Then she heard another high-pitched noise, followed by a chorus of tinny squeaks. Inching forward, she saw that the ground dropped suddenly off a small cliff. 
She peered over the edge. A clump of fur shifted restlessly under a dirt overhang. It took her a moment to realize the clump of fur was comprised of several clumps of fur pressed together, bobcat kittens pushing and curling against each other. The larger bobcat nudged the edges of the kitten pile, licking and mewing as she circled. She watched them for several minutes as an idea grew in her mind. Reaching inside her jacket pocket, she shifted through balls of paper-wrapped gum, discarded coins and buttons, and the most special rocks her children had handed over her over the past month. Her fingers closed around a pile of slippery papers. On the way back, she placed a small sticker on the trunk of every fifth tree. When she got home, she collected a bottle of milk, a paper bowl, and an open can of tuna. Her movements were fast and strong, propelled by purpose. Returning to the bobcats, she arranged the milk and tuna a safe distance away, but they did not even wait until she had retreated before approaching to investigate the food. She watched them lapping at the milk, her heart full. I'm going to skip to step eight. It started out as a fever, not even particularly high, a rosiness in his cheeks, a brighter shine in his eyes. Yet he was the youngest, so everyone made a big deal about it. He seemed to enjoy the attention. Three days later, he was coughing almost constantly. She watched helplessly as he drew in rattling, shaking breaths of air and expelled them violently, his small body nearly convulsing from the effort. Once, she placed both hands over her lower abdomen, remembering when he lived in the safety of her body, encased by her blood, her flesh, the cage of her bones. She wanted to wrap her arms around him and protect him from every harm in the world, but whatever was happening inside him was warring a battle she couldn't reach. The fever rose and fell, riding unpredictable waves of heat and chills that made her heart pound every time she pulled the thermometer from his mouth. He lay on his bed, surrounded by imprints of dinosaurs and trucks, his eyes half-closed and his breath wheezing through his lips. His older brothers raced up and down the hall outside the closed door, their screams and laughter punctuated by incoherent shouts from their father. She tried to tamp down her terror, but it sat in her stomach, heavy and ever-threatening to rise and overwhelm. She lay next to him, curling her body around his and pressing her ear to his back. Each dull thud of his heart soothed her. The next day, a strange rash spread from the center of his belly, an odd lacy red pattern that looked like crushed raspberries under his skin. They brought him to the hospital, a hub of chaos composed of brusque bureaucracy and human suffering. She held him close, feeling his hot breath on her neck as her husband spoke to the receptionist and her older boys chased each other between rows of empty chairs. Don't touch anything. Please don't touch anything. They placed him in a hospital bed, white on white on white. He looked so tiny, needles inserted into his arms, oxygen mask over his face. She tried not to, but tears leaked from the corners of her eyes with an almost mathematical precision, a true fountain of tears. Her husband leaned close. We've got to keep it together, except that everything was falling apart. After she took the older boys home for the night and put them to bed, she pulled out her phone to check for missed calls. The text message notification lit up, six missed messages. She sank to her knees and cradled the phone to her chest. The shame she felt felt like an actual weight that pushed her down and bowed her head. It's my fault. She wasn't religious, but she found herself whispering into the silence, her lips moving in an involuntary chant. Please let him be okay. Please let him be okay. I'll give you anything else instead. Just please don't take him. She raised her head and unlocked her phone. With a few swipes and taps, she deleted everything. So those are the passages, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the story, and um, thank you again for this opportunity. It is an honor um, and a joy. Thanks. Kahotek. Who will stand alone? Who will stand alone is a request for a volunteer, not something to dread. Isolation is solace, an untucking, a shoulder bone slumping but it is treated like a punishment I'm supposed to avoid. Girls who are not acceptable will be left alone. I do not want to be left alone forever. That is the old push-pull, a mournful note ricocheting through an empty chamber, self-selecting into solitude and still wanting someone to draw me out. Michael Stipe, when asked about the inspiration behind the lyrics of Kahotek, replied, I think it was the idea that relationships are or can be fleeting, of the moment, then gone. 
Michael is famously secretive about the meanings of his songs, but he was willing to gesture toward exposure, two behaviors deeply familiar to me. I'm trying to respond to each line. I'm trying to show you that I built myself into a cabinet with wooden doors, opened to reveal tiny pigeonhole crevices, little memories and moments rolled and tucked between the slats, trap doors and false fronts, and I am the only one who knows where to press to make them open. She carried ribbons. She wore them out. My mother used to keep ribbons and rubber bands in the shallow top drawer of a dresser misplaced into the dining room. It was beautiful, built with old wood, and I never understood why my parents didn't use it as an actual dresser. My parents had bought the dresser at a rural auction when they lived in Lafayette, Indiana during my father's graduate school years. They bid money they didn't really have because my woodworking father could tell the construction was quality. Nearly 20 years later, I took that dresser with me to college. In my apartment, I stuffed socks and underwear in the top drawer, smushed pajamas alongside pants in the bottom, stacked shirts in the middle. That was how my mother taught me to stock a dresser. That is how I stock my daughter's dressers. Yet that dresser is in my living room now, oddly enough. My husband calls it the Lafayette chest. It holds art supplies for my daughters in the bottom, art supplies for my husband in the middle, and ephemera in the top. I bet if I look, I can find ribbons. Courage built a bridge, jealous tore it down. We all carry the apocryphal stories of our youths into our adulthoods, those times someone discovered a crack and wrenched us apart. I was reading a friend's essay in which someone had asked her to confess the worst thing that had ever happened to her. I thought it was a terribly prying question. I was surprised by the presumption that she would share her secret with someone else. Most of my worst things will never see daylight again. They lie at the bottom of a crevice I will allow no one to repel toward. Instead, I tell the same betrayal stories we are accustomed to hearing across a restaurant table, like the one about the girls who stole my diary. I can sketch the scene quickly now after years of experience. I had recently moved to town. I didn't know who to trust. I had never been hurt by someone who called herself my friend. I can deepen the narrative, if my listener leans forward to show interest, by revealing that I had written in my diary that one of the girl's mothers was always gone, an observation which must have made the girl furious in her embarrassment. I rhetorically wave a hand over the awkward return of the diary, a transaction between my mother and the titular mother, and close with the image of me kneeling over the toilet, ripping out pages and flushing them, a dramatic finale for someone who now hoards the documented scraps of her childhood. I thought I was so courageous to tell the, the truth about the girl's mother, but the honesty of that bright reveal fizzled out upon arrival. What did I know? That is the foundational problem I carry with me today, distinguishing truth from disclosure. At least it's something you've left behind. The end of the 20 year anniversary cycle is coming. I've done a poor job of appropriately commemorating my first boyfriend in those seminal seven and a half months, which reverberated through my next seven and a half years. And I wonder why. I thought I'd be recreating the scenes and revisiting the locations, or at least intimately reliving them in my mind. My first boyfriend and I had engaged in a long distance relationship. My reconstructions, even at the time, were more vivid than our actual encounters. But all those moments finally feel distant. I wonder how one of my friends keeps her yearning alive, how she can sustain her writerly longing for a man who is not her husband so many years after those old events have erased, are erasing, the cells regenerating. I remember my Saturn return, when I was compelled to write down every encounter my first boyfriend and I ever had, collecting them in one master document, one recorded memoir. I can't fathom still clasping tightly the tense hope of our potential run-ins. I carry enough from the past. I cannot take on any more present. Like Kohotek, you were gone. The absence of something middling at best is still absence. It is not the absent person I long for, ever. 
I do not wish for the presence of my first boyfriend as much as I wish to feel that old nervous exhaustion of waiting for a surprise visit that never came. I do not miss his strangely timed three years post breakup email brags about baking bread and bikes, trying to show me still how weird he was. I miss never knowing when his name might come through the inbox and upset an entire day into a puddle of memory for the girl I had been. It was always the uncertainty and the waiting for an outstretched hand that I longed for. That absence is the hardest part to get over. The actual contact was disappointing, always, but the anticipation was brilliant. Okay. Um, thank you, witness. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, for the launch. I, and thank you for um, publishing this deeply embarrassing poem, which for some reason I wrote down <laughs> um, about a very difficult day I had. Apparently I edited that out because it's just called a difficult day. A difficult day. That the dog and my daughter both had their periods and mine was nearing its end just enough to believe I didn't need a tampon, but to stain my panties anyway. And there was a bout of lice, which I had given up on. And so invited a woman on the internet into our home, even though we were at the height of a pandemic wave and that we were all eating cookies burned on the bottom. And maybe the woman had her period too. The house smelled like teenage pads with wings and was decorated with shredded mouthfuls of bloody cotton from the strange diaper we had tried to pin on the dog, but which she ate. And on this very night, I was scheduled to read poems on Zoom with a man who says his own name in poems. Like if in this poem, I said, Nicole, your dog and daughter are bleeding and the whole house has lice. When my daughter started her period, someone said I should throw her a party, but I took her for pancakes. Of course, it's embarrassing, all of it, this life, syrup on your chin while you tell a child she's now a woman. And shortly after, I tried to write a poem in the voice of Robert Browning called my last period. And I sent my menopause and index out to several venues and was rejected, though I've stopped calling it rejection. Declined. I was declined. Yesterday morning, I confessed to my other daughter, the younger one, that I had once eaten a scab. And this morning, my friend sent me a picture of his healing thumb, and I responded, bodies are amazing. Do I think bodies are amazing? That I nursed my daughters for years and then had my breasts cut off, like in some kind of too perfect novel. And the dog wouldn't wear her cone once we had her spayed. So I sat with her on the couch try, to try to keep her from licking her wounds. When she was young, my older daughter, the one who now hasn't gotten her period in quite a while because of stress or counting too many calories, her friends were all named after blood, scarlet, rose, that sort of thing. My God how lonely life can be, how mostly, Nicole, it feels like sitting on a toilet, wiping and wiping until you can no longer see the blood. Thanks.